now take the privilege to humbly request our Honorable Chief Guest, His Excellency Dr. S.C. Jameer, to kindly address the gathering. Dignitary Sandhya Dayas, <clears throat> dear delegates, media persons, ladies and gentlemen, I'm indeed extremely happy to meet all of you this morning in the inaugural function of this conference. I welcome you all. The school deserves our appreciation for organizing such a wonderful conference, Sai Moon 2015, that aims at creating a platform for young minds where they will be exposed to diplomacy, negotiation, and professional communication, albeit in an enacted environment. I had decided that I would not tell you about leaders from whom you could fail to relate to, but this particular diplomacy remind me of a quote from Jagi Gilbreth, a famous economist and himself an ambassador to India. He was commenting on the nature of the job of ambassador, and he said in good humor that an ambassador is an honest person deputed to foreign countries to tell lies for his own country, unquote. But humor apart, let me tell you that seeing your bright and beaming faces and hearing two words, United Nations, has made me a bitter, a bit nostalgic. I can simply say that most of you present here today in the auditorium were not even born when he was sent to United Nations headquarters in New York. I was barely 31 years old then and Bandit Nero proposed my name to be one of the delegates and political advisor of the delegation. I met the Prime Minister, you see, and I had 24 our access to him as his political advisor and political secretary. And I told him point blank that I could not handle the job in the United Nations. And that I did not have any experience whatsoever. However, Prime Minister asked me to go and learn in that big house. That was how I had landed in New York, trembling in bone chilling cold because I did not have any coats or winter suits. And would, would believe me, I did not have enough money in my pocket too. And then I settled down participated in many conferences, many committees, and most importantly, saw some of the world leaders of that area from close quarter. I learned a lot just watching them leaders from Russia, from United Kingdom, from China, and many other big countries of the world spoke with great authority. Their autocratic, aristocratic way of delivering an address and ready wit contributed a lot to the process of my being a mature human being as well as a leader. But why do I recount all this? It is because I am optimistic that some of you may go on to represent your nation in international forum, be it United Nations or the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank or the World Health Organization. The possibilities are many only sky is a limit. However, behind narrating my own experience is hidden another reason. Let us very briefly make a brief comparison between my childhood days and yours. I'm afraid there will not be a single similarity. Most of you, almost all of you, hail from affluent families and dwelling in urban areas whereas I belong to rural background. Your classrooms are air-conditioned. You, you watch LED TVs. All of you have modern mobile phones and computers. My childhood days were spent in lantern light. 
not even candles. I did not have shoes, and I had to walk around 50 kilometers to appear at the metric examination. These things today are around like reading out from the pages of a fantasy novel. Yet we have seen that period, and today I watch with great pride and satisfaction because it is at this age you know things on operate gadgets which we could never master in our lifetime. You have so much knowledge and so plenty of information at such an early age that your generation is poised to transform our society and the world in general into a place of peace, love, and brotherhood. As a, personal, as a person who has seen much life, I would offer a word of wisdom to all of you. Learn to depend less on gadgets. Depending on gadgets diminishes your individual ability. In other words, master the gadgets, but become not a slave of it. We are living in a modern area. We live in a knowledge society where knowledge is the capital, and those who manage knowledge will have control over all others. Countries that fail to create a quality force of knowledge managers will be left behind and will have to depend on nations which have knowledge. Simple as that, the next few decades will belong to knowledge rich nations there is possibility that these nations will control the global balance of power. I think you understand what I'm saying. Many believe there will also be knowledge overflow. You are now, in fact, too young to understand the implications of what I say. And in this world of abundant knowledge, there may arise a scenario where there will be chaos. There will be information and there will be knowledge. There will be new scientific and technological invention in plenty. This is a real concern for all of us. Here, instead of concern, we should use the expression challenge. The challenge here is, will our advancement in knowledge empty us of our wisdom? And make no mistake that information is not knowledge, nor knowledge is wisdom. A simple story I would like to tell you to drive home what I want to say. This is a story of four friends. The four friends are highly knowledgeable and each one is real master in his specialization. While going through a forest, they came across a heap of bones. One of the friends says that, this, that his knowledge tells him that these were the bones of a lion. The second friend says, his knowledge enables him to join the bones in most correct manner. And the third one says, his specialization enables him to put the skin, flesh, and blood on the skeletons. And the fourth one goes up that he's a gold medalist in his profession, in his specialization. And he said he can infuse life into the body. At that time, a simple villager came and advises these four knowledgeable friends that infusing life into the body of a lion means that the lion will spring into life and kill all of them. But these four friends laughed at this simple villager. The village man knows what awaited them. He climbs on a tree. Thereafter, the four friends, who is a gold medalist and knowledge to bring dead into life, he brought back the lion to back, to life to back. And hungry as the animal was, it kills the four knowledgeable friends. Friends, now I believe you have an idea about what knowledge is and what wisdom is. They have, all of them have knowledge how to revive a dead lion into life, but they didn't have wisdom that the lion would kill them. I will take this opportunity to make an appeal to the teachers and parents to inspire students 
to develop an insight so that they are able to know the difference between knowledge and wisdom. The Simon will go on three days, on for three days. This year's team is one family in the whole world is a family. The philosophy behind this concept is some thousand years old. It predates the Greek civilization. When humanity declared this unique wisdom, the world is a family. There was no knowledge, no catches to translate it into in reflections in human character and civilization. Why, after some thousands of years, we still are running after it? The idea of the global or world family. Maybe we had wisdom, but no knowledge to convert that wisdom into a real phenomenon. And now when we have millions of gadgets produced by constant guest quest for knowledge, we have lost wisdom somehow and somewhere. So we see that war, strife, torture, mindless violence, intolerance, and jealousy are on the rise. Despite all this, the world is still the most beautiful place to live in because it is full of possibilities. Possibilities in the fields of music, art, literature, science, engineering, architecture, filmmaking, medical science, and whatnot. And tell me who will exploit these possibilities and explore new horizons. It is you only. While you engage in pursuits of own interests, try to no, there is no question of trying here. You must imbibe the spirit of the world is a family, and therefore all inhabitants are brothers and sisters. With this philosophy as a practicing principle in your life, you'll soon realize that many of your family members are illiterate, underfed, homeless, sick, and destitute. Many are also differently able. Soon you will realize that you have a lot to do for them. Such members of your extended family, maybe in Asia, Africa, Australia, Europe, the Northern South America, and anywhere. But then there are millions like you who will soon become achievers in different fields. My only appeal to you is that you should not forget the suffering millions and you should share some of your achievements with them. Only then today's theme, the world is a family, will find its reflection in the matter of your actions. However, what is the first and the only requirement for this generous philosophy to become a part of your existence? It is love. When your heart is full of love, you achieve the impossible. Let me call the couplet from a 14th century A.D. poet, Jalaluddin Rumi, and I call, Through love, all that is bitter will be sweet. Through love, all that is copper will be gold. Through love, all drags will become wine. Through love, all pain will turn to medicine. For three days, all of you will be engaged in a host of activities to keep you a feeling of United Nations and its functions. I'm not aware if anything is planned to invite some persons having experience and exposure in the United Nations. This model United Nations aims at grooming you in different activities from enhancing your ability to speak in a public forum to inculcating in your qualities of leadership negotiating skills, etc. To me, all the activities during these three days aim at giving you a feel of the United Nations while making you a smarter individual. I say smarter because you are already smart. This again reminds one of the anecdotes that involved Lord Louis Mountbatten, the last viceroy of India. Mountbatten, you need to know, was the last viceroy of India when the British were forced to leave India. India became an independent nation. 
Someone asked Mountbatten a question, something like this. Mr. Viceroy, who is the smartest person on earth? With that blinking and eyelid, the Viceroy himself, one of the smartest men on earth at that time, replied, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind as to who is the smartest person. Mahatma Gandhi is the smartest person on earth. And I'll repeat that as many times as you wish. Now at that time, the world was full of great leaders. The world was full of great leaders. But Manbaden had no doubt in his mind. Why Gandhiji? An old man with a walking stick and a thudi in Jadar, a frail physic. He did not have suits, tie, and costly wristwatch. Nothing. The question wanted to know the reason from what button. What the last viceroy said was still more amazing. He said that he always felt nervous while facing the frail old man and many so-called have brave leaders who made Gandhiji felt like that. My dear young friends, I want all of you to be brought up like that. I admit that there will never be another like Gandhiji, but I'm sure there will be men and women with values and virtues, and when they used to, to rise to speak, the listeners are mesmerized, and when they begin negotiation, the men on the other side of the table feels nervous. Each of you has that quality sleeping somewhere inside you. Some of you, or maybe none of you, will go to the United Nations as your nation representative. But take a place today in the same moon that you will become qualitatively so good that others will bow to you, not in fear, but in love. With these words, let me co conclude with a quote from one of our ancient scriptures, and I quote, without faith there is no knowledge, without knowledge there is no virtuous conduct, without virtues there is no deliverance, and without deliverance there is no perfection. Thanks again, and Jai.